is with Elisha, not Spirit of the Lord. Um, that's not a shot. That's just a, that's just a statement of fact. That, yeah, God's now got the same spirit on Elijah that was in you because or else how could you take his mantle and split the Jordan? We get it. But what does that say about you? So don't mistake the difference here because watch. The story unfolds. And they came to meet him in verse 15, and they bowed before to the, to the ground before him because, again, they see God's power working in and through him now. So they're, like, thinking of him as, you know, he's the guy. They're like, whoa, we've got to follow this guy. But in verse 16, they, he said unto, they said unto him, Behold now, there, there, be with thy, there be with your servants fifty strong men. Let them go and, and pray you and seek your master, and let's pray adventure. Now watch, the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or in some valley. What? They thought that, he, some of these people thought, fifty men thought that Elijah's taking up was a judgment that God was going to cast him on the mountainside as if to kill him or cast him in the valley. Really? That was not a judgment, doofus. They were like, yeah, there's fire, there's a whirlwind. How could it not be? You weren't there, man. You weren't there. You don't understand. <laughs> no. You don't understand. He's like, oh, I'm sure that it might be. Let's go look. He's like, you're not going to fight. Don't do that. So in verse, what, what does this represent, by the way? Of the Sumeticos that are watching from, from a distance, are all of them 144,000? No. There's tons of Sumeticos people. Remember, there's tons of, of Technon, Pation, and, and Nanisco's people. There's tons of them. And of those tons, only 144,000 of those become faithful Sumeticos. There's a lot of unfaithful ones. That's what these people represent. Of the Sumeticos who do not become faithful ones, 144,000, there's the other ones who believe what their human flesh tells them, which is they can't be the bad guys, they can't have any need for growth, so they must impute unto Elijah that he must have been the one that was judged because they're the ones who are the good guys. They're presumptive, stubborn, and arrogant still. They don't see themselves as lower shelf. They see themselves as the better ones, and Elijah is the lower shelf one, and that's why they're saying God must have judged him and cast him on the mountainside or valley. Let's go find him. Let's go find his carcass. Um, no. Elisha is going, you guys are ignorant. He says, and he said, verse 17, he urged him until he, was, until he was ashamed. Why was he ashamed? He was ashamed because they didn't believe the Spirit of the Lord was on him. And why would they not believe that? Because, again, he didn't have yet in his life any fruit yield to produce, to lean back on, for them to know that it wasn't just God's power in his life split into Jordan. God's fruit yield in his life had shown depth of understanding with application or fruit yield. If he had that, they'd have believed him. They didn't believe him. And that's why he was ashamed. He knew that being a mentee of Elijah, my goodness, I should have been further along. Because if I was, they'd have listened to me. God just did a miracle through me, and they still don't believe what I'm saying. He's ashamed. He has to repeat himself. He's ashamed. But he knows he owns that. That's on him. That's on him for saying, you know what, I didn't have my fruit yield. I can't blame it on them. God can work through anybody. He showed that through Ahab, remember? It's the fruit yield of, of depth of understanding that comes out of that depth of understanding is the, the new wineskin, the depth of understanding, and then and the new wine, the, the fruit that comes out of it. He didn't have that, so they didn't see the spirit of the Lord on him. They saw, again, the spirit of Elijah on him, which is why in verse 16, again, they said, let's seek your master, lest the spirit of the Lord has taken him up. If they understand how to make that phrase, why didn't they say about Elisha, Hey, we saw you part the Jordan. The Spirit of the Lord's on you. They didn't say that. They said Spirit of Elijah, as if to, again, see him as second tier, as see him as lesser value, to see him as not as high esteem as they saw Elijah. And why would they say that? Because he had no depth of knowledge exhibited and the fruit of his life up to this point. And Elisha was embarrassed. He was embarrassed. Because he meant well and intended well, but he knew that God was humbling him at the very beginning. This is the beginning of what he asked for, remember? I want the whole portion of your spirit. And Elijah goes, you know what you're asking for? This is his first labor pain. This is his first contraction. Doesn't feel good, does it, Elisha? To have a miracle of God shown in and through you, and yet people who are sons of the prophets 
don't even impute to you and see you as my spirit working in and through you. They see the spirit of Elijah, not my spirit. How's it feel? He's like, my garbage. I feel ashamed. I feel disgusted. And he said, and he, and he, and he, and he said he was ashamed. He said, send. And they went for us. He, he, he gave into it. He was disgusted. He just said, fine, send them. He's like, he can't convince them. They have to see for themselves. They sent their 50 men there for, and they sought three days. Three days. What a coincidence. Moses and Elijah and Revelation 11, verses 9 to 11, lie dead in the street for three days. And then rise up again. Well, three and a half days. It says, and they came back. It's so crazy. For three days, and they came again, and, they, and he tarried at Jericho, and he, and, they, and he said unto them, they found them not, they, they told him, he said in verse 18, didn't I tell you we weren't going to see, not going to find them? I told, you, I told you not to go. So here's the thing. Verse 18, he tarried in Jericho. Back up in verse uh, 12 and 13, he was lamenting at the shore of Jordan. So I believe he lamented for probably a couple hours before what happened with him parting the river with the mantle. But when he crossed over to Jericho, he was still in a place of mourning and despondency because likened unto the horses and chariots, first time they're mentioned, is in reference to mourning from Israelites, is to mourn Joseph's death. That's for seven days, Genesis 50, 9 and 11. Or 9 and 10, excuse me. Verse 9 and 10. Just like Elisha went to Jericho, and of all places, he didn't go to Gilgal, which is right there. He went to Jericho. Why Jericho? Because he was thinking about what God had just done, how he took away Elijah. He ended something. Now, what does he have to now destroy in his mindset of the old thinking, of the old ways? What does he have to now keep a remnant of truth on to build forward on? What did he glean from God and from Elijah's life? Because there's a reason and a purpose for all of that. What's he going to take from that? What's he going to glean from that? What's he going to What's he going to do next? So in verse, in verse 8, verse 19, And the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, I pray you, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is evil or not, and the ground is barren. Now, here you have, again, this is after seven days, I believe, because he tarried there in verse 18. I believe it's seven days. It's depicting the seven days of mourning, in my opinion. I don't know that for a fact. That's my conjecture of based on the data of verses 12 and 13 and 18 put together, and also comparing that Genesis 50, verses 9 and 10. Because the water is not, and the ground is barren, meaning that the the salt that heals the water in Jericho, because remember, Jericho was a place where it was a place of redefining and healing. It's supposed to be destroying the old way of thought and adding new application because of the new framework of thought. And so he has to now, God now brings him, he says in verse 20, bring me a new cruise. And he put salt therein, and they brought, to, brought it to him. And they went forth from the spring of waters, and he cast the salt, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. They, they shall not be from thence any more, no death. Jericho at this point represents that there was no more, because this represents the deputization, as, as Nancy puts it, of the soon medicos. There was death. They were, de they were not bearing forth fruit. They weren't, the waters needed to be healed. They didn't have the, the, the savoriness and the, the perseverance and preservation of salt. So he added salt for savory and for preservation. And he added life to bring forth from death. The Sue Medicos who were unfaithful, some became faithful. What Elisha did as the chief Sue Medicos is impute. He was the one who deputed God through him, as you say, deputized. He called people in Jericho at this point, representing the Sue Medicos who would then total the 144,000. That's what's meant by the salt in the water. And now there's no more death. The land is no longer barren. It brings forth fruit. That's what's happened. So Elisha is showing you in typology, this is what happened. After he crossed over, after the seven days of mourning, it wasn't instantaneous. It was seven days later. I believe that then God then uses him as the chief sin medicos in type to lead the others to no longer be barren and longer be unsavory. They're now becoming of savory and of, pre of, of, pres of preservation, and they actually bear forth fruit. The lamb is no longer barren. That happened in Jericho, not Gilgal, because it showed Jericho was the place where old mentalities old framework had to, be, had to be destroyed. A new framework had to be put on. He had to change the framework. And he did that. Because Jericho was a framework of barrenness and of death. But he changed that. God did. 
to represent the soon medicos were now changed to bring forth the hundred fruit. So in verse 22, he says, So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the word of Elisha when he spoke. Speaking to, when he says unto this day, speaking to the, the faithful one status of the ongoing benefits and rewards that are theirs of the soon medicos, the 144,000 that is, that become savory and fruit bearing, no longer barren. Because at that point, up to that point, they were. Remember, they were all oi necroi. They were all dead ones. They were all dead ones to the fruit of the sperma. And of those oi necroi, God took 144,000 out of there and made them no longer barren and added salt to their life. They became savory and, pers and, they, and they had perseverance. They had preservation. They became fruit yield people. But then in verse 23 to 25, we end our story for today. And he went up from thence unto Bethel. Now see that? He's, he's backtracking exactly. He goes from Jordan, pauses, Jericho. The pause is actually similar to that they're walking. There was some time they spent there. Go to Jericho, goes to Bethel. Why do you go to Bethel? Because he just got finished being the chief one who deputized other student medicos who now they finally see, they're starting to see God's fruit in his life directly. Because before it was associated to the Elijah's mantle. This is the first time his, his miracle was done without the mantle being used directly. And he goes to Bethel to do what? To reconcile and have peace with God. Notice how it happened to him quickly. Elijah took to the end of his first earthly ministry to have reconciliation and peace with God. Elisha gets it right off the bat. He's like Paul in that way. He was quickly rising up in maturation. He was quickly astute. To, that's why you'll see the next couple of stories. They're, they're, that's why his miracles are so much more, because he was typifying the quick ascension of a person who goes from zero to 100. It's unbelievable. You can't do that slowly. You do that very quickly, OK? It's like Paul said, he's like someone born out of time. Out of, out of it's time. almost like he's likening himself to the chief Sioux Medicoy there. Correct. Because the chief Sioux Medicoy, that's what happens. If, if the Sioux Medicoy is in general grow really fast, the chief one grows the fastest because he has to lead them. And here's Elisha going right from this call. In other words, this deputization or this calling out of 144. Directly after that, he goes, he goes right into getting himself reconciled and making peace with God, from which the foundation is then built to have that double fruit yield. It's unbelievable. So he, you, you see this, but then what happens is he goes to Bethel. When he's, when he's, when he's, so the path of reconciliation and peace comes with resistance. And here he comes to Christ. Going, and going up, by the way, there came forth little lads. I believe these are technon of sporos. I think these particular people are, are reconciled. These are kids that are children of, of not a heavenly promise, but of the earthly promise. And how, why do I think that? Because they're mocking and ridiculing him. Because they don't understand. Because people in Testament during the second part of the tribulation are not going to have the tolerance for different understandings of depth of knowledge. And they're going to be so far into their apostasy of going away from the truth. They're going to be really irritated by anyone who claims that they have a uniqueness with God. But interesting enough, it says here, they say it twice. Go up, they ridiculed him, they mocked him, and said, go up, thou little bald head, baldy. Go up, bald head, baldy. As if to, again, two times, which shows division and separation, which is why I think they're of sporos. God had them say it twice to let you see they are not like the soon medicos who were barren and unfruitful with the, with the unhealed waters of God's word in their life. No, these were divided against those people because they were mocking him. They weren't just barren and unsalty. They were, they were apostatizing. They were ignorant of this truth. They called him Baldi because, again, they were actually indignant that he would be the one who would lead and be the charge of all those in Testament, that he's the guy in charge, not everybody is in Christ. Who made you the new captain of the, of the team, the new sheriff in town? Well, God, I didn't. God did, so I don't have to tell you. Remember, he didn't do that. The mantle fell on him. And he even he didn't ask God, where's the God? And, and he, no, we're all just party. He knew it was him. God gave him affirmation. First God's sovereign hand fell on him, then God gave him affirmation with the party using the same mantle. But in verse 24, as soon as they mock him and they jeer him, what, is, what does he do in verse 24? He turns and looks at them. And by the way, the word turn is he turns swiftly. As soon as he heard those two comments, go up, Baldy, go up, Baldy, he turns back quickly and just, by the way, the word is peel. It means he, 
he looked, he stared at them, he looked at them, and he swiftly cursed, repeatedly, more intensified them. So he didn't just curse them and say, he, he said it repeatedly and with, with intensity. He said a curse to them in the name of the Lord. Um, what? He didn't say it in his flesh. He said that in the name of the Lord. In other words, you have no other chance to do what's pleasing to God unless you listen to me. And you're going to do that. Then he knows by definitive nature you're cursed. Because there is nobody else. In typology, there is nobody else who leads the charge of spiritual truth and second half truth. He's the only guy. So he had no, he, there was no, he's not, he's not being forward or presumptuous upon God. He knows. He's the one. He knew it by twofold God's testimony. The sovereign act of the mantle falling on him out of a whirlwind. And secondly, God dividing the water when he said, where is Lord God? And God called, he knew. He was the one. So when they start mocking him, as he's making peace regulation to God, they mock him, and he just says, okay, um, you guys are, he swiftly looks at them, stares at them, and says, repeatedly, you're cursed in the name of Chave, the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods. I believe this speaks to the beast and the opponent, two she-bears. Because all they're about is gathering up those that need to worship him or die. And by the way, there's 42 of them. What a coincidence. There's also 42 months in the second half of tribulation. What a coincidence. There's 42 months in tribulation period, second half. It's broken up by 42 months first half, 42 months second half, right? And he tears them in two, the she-bears out of the woods. Out of the woods meaning what? That the beast and the opponent, that the darkness and that whole deceitfulness of despair. The woods speak to the darkness and the despair that one feels of when because oh, animals live in the woods, not humans. Right? We don't no, we don't thrive in the woods. We could live in the woods, but <laughs> so it speaks to the whole wild that wild life. And you see that this this forest speaks to that wild darkness of the second half of this beast and the opponent dominantly are just the landscape of demonic activity is off the chart. And they tears and he tore forty and two children of them. There was 42 children he tore in part. The word tore means to cleave. That means he ripped them in half. Um, yikes. Yikes. Remember when God says about, in Matthew 24, he, he tears asunder, he dichotomizes the servant? God does that. But here, the two she-bears, they, they didn't dichotomize. They just split the body in half. They tore, they tore them in half. It's just, ugh. Is it possible there were more than 42 since we're told exactly 42? Maybe some of them didn't get. I, I'm just wondering. I, I, well, I wondered that myself. It's funny you said that. I, I was going to ask. I was going to say that same thing. Was there more than 42 children that were knocking him, but only 42 were the ones mentioned to be killed? Maybe. I don't know. I, I thought about that. Not that I could see um, said that, but um, the reason I thought that, I don't know. I'm thinking that because it says children of the city. So was there more than 42? I mean, probably more than 42, that's what I'm thinking. So maybe 42 represents those who continue to double down, whereas the other ones, when they, when he heard, when they, when they heard that that was that didn't seem right, maybe they, I don't know. I don't know. So I, I, it made me think I don't know, but I just know 42 were killed. And when, how they were killed is just horrific. Two sheep, uh, two she-bears that tore them in half. That's just horrific. It represents those who are of the, in Christ people, who are doubling down on apostasy, are going to be overrun by demonic destruction. So they, people think, well, demons will never overcome me. They will, when you re continue to reject and rebel against God's word, they will. You cannot stand up against, because remember, those are sporos. The only way to prevent yourself from being, um, meeting, your, meeting a, an unfaithful uh, demise is to, in faith, give your life over to God by having yourself be beheaded. By not taking the mark of the beast and not worshiping him, you voluntarily bring forth your life to, to die. So when you're, when you're killed by the Antichrist by not being beheaded, which is typified by these people, being by she-bears, I think the she represent the demonic activity that overruns amok people in testament. So when you die that way, you're not the same martyr as the one seen in Revelation or under the altar. Those are heirs. These are not. You can die in tribulation in two ways, being in Christ. You can die willingly or unwillingly. You die unwillingly, that is not a good thing. People think, well, if I die, I die. No, 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 no. Die willingly for Christ, then you'll be an heir. 
as the one of the sporos people of the earth. You die this way, you're disinherited. And that's what happened to these people. And that's why the next thing you see, what does is, what is Elisha do? He's going back, instead of going to Gilgal, he didn't go there, he goes all the way up to Carmel. From thence he went to Mount Carmel, and then he returned to Samaria, which is the uh, king's... Uh, outside of this 144 what? And by, and by the way, and, and to, to, why did he go to Mark, Mount Carmel? Mount Carmel is where Israelites, who knew the God of Covenant, aligned themselves with evil. And they were brought to their death by Elijah. What do you think just happened? People in Testament aligned themselves with the evil one, saying Elisha is he's being mocked. That's what the beast and the opponent are doing, most of the opponent. And he goes, you align yourself with him, and you will die. And they did. Demonic presence overtook them, typified by the she-bears, out of the woods, the darkness of demonic activity. To typify this in God's statement, what a coincidence, he goes to Carmel. Oh, you know, this the coincidence of when the event happened, when the man of God singled out the, those who are also of covenant people who aligned themselves with Baal and were brought to their death. What a coincidence. I think not. I think not. Elisha's making it clear. You align yourself against me. You're not aligning yourself against me. You're aligning yourself against God. Get that through your head. And these people here thought more about picking on him for some physical attribute he couldn't change, by the way. So we think about, well, it's his, it's his fault. It's his delivery of the message. It's his, no, it's his visage he couldn't change. He's bald. You can't change that. It's like saying I'm short or I'm tall. Or you can't change your your physical appearance. Well, there's no plastic surgery back then, okay? So he can't change the fact he's bald. He's bald. Why? So the point is, people say, well, he, they, they wouldn't have mocked him if he wouldn't have, wouldn't have what? Been who he is? He, he can't change. He's bald. So don't think they mocked him because of this. Why did God do that? Because like the person who told me on, on Friday, that he told me he told me truth about watching my attitude, but he, he said this. He goes, you know, because if you act the way you act sometimes, because I was getting frustrated with him. Again, didn't cuss, didn't demean him, just was frustrated about the experience, giving him examples. But he said, but if you act that way, then some people won't be saved. No, that's not true. You're saved or not because God's will in your life. I have, I have nothing to do with that. I'm either used or I'm not used to be facilitating God's ultimate goal. I cannot facilitate God's will, nor can I thwart God's will, nor can I resist God's will. I can only be used to accomplish it, whether I'm righteous or unrighteous in the process. is irrelevant. His will is done with or without me. Don't put that malarkey in there that I somehow can go put a stop to God's will. That, that's just dumb. You can't do that. And that's why God used Elisha's boldness as if to say, stop with the malarkey. He had nothing to do with this. That's what God was trying to make sure you will really understand. That those people in Christ who make fun of you and me has nothing to do with you, has to do with them. We do nothing to, to facilitate or solicit this mockery and ridicule. That's because they are angry at God and they're taking it out on you because just what you represent Elisha represented a person that they wanted to make fun of because he was bald. He couldn't change that. He didn't select, and, the, and they didn't like, it wasn't a menu in, 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 the, in the womb as a fetus. I want baldness. Yeah, you hear me? And I want uh, green eyes. You can't. God gives you what he gives you, period. Right? So people have hatred towards you or malice towards you or try to associate some guilt towards you as to why they're not doing something or why someone's not. Now, you have your sins, as I have mine. But that's on them. Don't you dare associate to me some other reason why someone, no, you're not doing that because it's between God's will and your responsibility. I own my responsibilities. Do I contribute to a success or failure? Yes, but I'm not the cause. I contribute. That's the best I could ever do, good or bad. I can contribute. You are ultimately in the will and hand of God and your own consequence of your responsibilities and your accountabilities to do what's right. Yes, I sorry. Think they're, they're looking on the outward appearance. They're saying, you don't look good, you're not good. That's right. He, he didn't look the part. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, he could have put, yeah, yeah, it's funny. He could have put some of this. That's funny. Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, Elisha and Elijah have a strong story. We're coming out to the end of our time. So a lot of strong uh, just typology and, and, and principles and depth of the story here that we're now in the transition period, but now we're gonna take off with Elijah for the next 
what is it, chapter 13, so the next uh, uh, 11 chapters, we'll be talking about Elisha and how he unfolds, how God uses him. So we're on the second half of the stories now with the typology, even though we have 11 chapters left. We'll be looking into Elisha and how God used him as we continue to reflect on the transition between Elijah and Elisha and what it all means. Because to me, it's been profoundly interesting. It also has rel relevance to my personal interactions of my own situations I've experienced, the failures I've experienced and not doing what I'm supposed to do and, and my behaviors and my thoughts. And so um, and I, I, I feel convicted in a lot of ways. And, but I know that God's still a restorative God and a, and, a, and a refreshing God and a loving God and a compassionate God and a forgiving God. And so I know all that to be true. I just don't want to exploit that, but I do want to cling to that. I do want to cling to 1 John 1, 9. He confessed my, I confess my sins, and he's faithful and just. To forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I want to acknowledge who I am and what I'm not. I'm grateful for who I am and where he's got me as well. Where he's got me, where he's at. I'm, I'm where he wants me to be. You're where he wants you to be. But we got to continue to progress, continue to be challenged, to, to change and be forged and to be reshaped, always be under construction. Embrace the construction in our life of God, reforging, breaking, remolding, using people and places and things and events that are not easy to receive and, and embrace all of that and, and acknowledge one's shortcomings and sinfulness and all that stuff and use it all to be God, for, to put it in God's hands so he can harness that and use it to show his own glory in our life. Let's close in prayer. We'll turn to our Lord's table and we honor communion uh, in our next half of service. So, Father, we just pray now. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be uh, learning from you, from your word, from your truth that you give through and in Elijah and Elisha, how you show us so much opportunity to where we can grow and learn, understand your will, your heart, your ways of being higher than our ways, your thoughts higher than our thoughts. We continue to ask you to help to encourage us when we need to be lifted up, convict us of our presumption and stubborn arrogance that we have and we don't want to hear and see you because we want to see you in a certain way or hear you in a certain way or you know use every reason that we have available to our flesh to resist the truth instead we should just sift through all the noise all the clamoring around and, and be like Elisha and just ignore what everybody thinks everybody says and just embrace the moments even though we know the end will come, we didn't know when that'll happen. So between now and then, embrace the moments that we have. The moments not just with you, but with others that you've used indirectly to speak in and through us, and, and into us as well. That you just want to surround us with opportunities to, to learn, to gather in your truth and your love and your presence of who you are and what your word has to say to us to be changed. We thank you for again being our Father who forgives and restores us. Be with us now to look to your last table in the remembrance of your sacrifice you gave to us before you left this earth, only to let us know you're coming again. So be with us now, Father. We ask you for all this in Jesus' Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so our, our lesson here.